Good afternoon. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with you, um, both in person and online. And I wanted to welcome you to this class. It was originally scheduled last semester. And the title of it was, She Weren't No Faintin' Lily Nor a Battle Axe. And I will be honest with you, um, there were a couple of, of um, ideas that I had for that title. As we went on, um, I was tired, I'll be honest, of writing it out each time she weren't, and I just kind of started using the term, the stories of Kansas pioneer women. So if that's what you signed up for, just know it's one and the same. Um, wanted to tell you, uh, for some of you who may be, this is the first time you've ever been in one of my classes, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a fourth generation Kansan. I grew up on a farm in Stafford County. And in fact, my home now is in St. John, Kansas. And I grew up with several formidable women in my life. And I'm guessing a lot of you did too. And um, so that's kind of one of the reasons I wanted to do this class. Another was that a friend of mine called me a battle ax. And it was based on this cartoon. When we call a rather formidable woman a battle ax, we are harking back to the late 19th century. American magazine concerned with women's rights called the battle ax. Now, have any of you been called a battle ax? <laughs> Have you been called fainting lilies? <laughs> well, that's my point. I don't think many of us really fit either one of those terms. But yet, a lot of times through history, that is how women have been labeled. And so I wanted to kind of start on that. The other thing I needed to tell you a little bit about myself is that I've been a journalist in Kansas for more than four decades. And um, I've written many, many stories, at least for the Wichita Eagle 8,000 or more. And um, I have come to know Kansans fairly well. And we, I think, are a strong, hearty group and we are diverse, and we have many, many stories to share. A little bit about how this class will unfold. Um, this week, this, this session, I'll give kind of an overview of Kansas uh, women that are, have been rather notable or have made fame one way or the other. Um, but next week, it's going to be up to you guys. And I'm going to interview you, uh, but I also want you to do your homework. And I want you, we'll talk about that in a moment. So anyway, that's what we're going to be doing next week. And I'm really pleased to also tell you, we will have for the next two weeks after that, on August 21st and August 28th, some Kansas humanities speakers coming to talk with us. And I think that's rather prestigious. Um, but um, anyway, uh, Priska Barnes is going to be talking about the Dockham drugstore sit-in and the roles that women played in that. Doesn't that sound interesting? How many of you don't know about the Dockham drugstore sit-in? Is there anyone? Okay. Um, and it's one, something that only, I'm going to say, maybe in the last 10 to 15 years has gotten a little more coverage and, and uh, well-known. Um, I, I, I'm trying to remember if it was 1957 or 1958. It was the summer of when a um, group of, high, of youth from the local NAACP um, 
had a sit-in at the Dockham Drugstore down um, in downtown, and it's where the um, Ambassador Hotel is now. But it was essentially, at that time, um, those who were African American were not served at the cafeteria. They had to get their food I, to go uh, or not at all. And so these youth um, staged a sit-in. And um, they staged the first successful um, sit-in in the nation. Other sit-ins have gotten more attention um, through the years, but it wasn't until about maybe five or ten years ago that more notice was given to what happened here in Wichita. So I think that will be an excellent, excellent um, topic. Yes? Absolutely. Come up here and talk, would you? That way everyone can hear, and thank you for doing that. I sometimes need to stand to be corrected, so just know that. It's a slight correction in that it was the first student-led yes. sit-in. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, there was another one in Greensboro, yes. South Carolina. Yes. That's, that's um, featured, um, their lunch counter is now in the Smithsonian Institution. Right. Ours was first, but ours was student-led, right. not just the general adults. And isn't that cool? I mean, in, when you think about in the nation, I think that is a wonderful, wonderful point. And also, I want to just say one more thing. Please, at any point, feel free to um, ask questions or make comments. When you do, though, I want you to use this microphone because that way um, people online can also hear what you're saying and, and they can make comments later, too. So... Um, that's, that's something I think that will be kind of fun. We have someone else coming up. I think it's getting more attention because of Gretchen Icke's book. Absolutely, and she has done so much to document mm -hmm. um, the history on this. You're absolutely well, right. Well, she found out some interesting information. She found out that uh, the national NAACP office told the kids to stop. They were trying to get legislation through Congress, and they thought the kids were stirring up too much. So I think that will be a wonderful topic that we can explore. Thank you for that comment. I think those will be that will be a great topic to explore in a couple of weeks. And then the final speaker will be Erica Nelson. And I don't know if you guys know her or not, but she um, is um, the... Oh, I will get the title of the uh, place wrong, but it is in Lucas, but it's like the world's largest collection of the, sm or the, the world's smallest collection of the world's largest objects uh, in, in uh, um, Lucas. And so I think, and she is a hoot, and I think you will enjoy her. Her topic will be Wonder Workers, the Self-Made work works of visionary female artists. So I think that will be an excellent topic to explore. So we get to the point of where we talk about next week's assignment. I want you to think about who are the Kansas women who have influenced you. And what did they teach you? You know, who were your role models? Were they family? Were they teachers? Were they someone in the community, neighbors? It doesn't matter. But I think this is a, we're at a turning point, I think, in, in our society. And um, I think we are, it, we are at a point where it's important, I think, to um, tell the stories of the women who have influenced us in life because I truly do believe that once we are gone, those stories will be lost. And I think these women did wonderful things. And um, so I just want you to think about that. Um, 
the way you can share these stories with me, especially those of you who are online, my email address is btanner11 at cox.net. Now, I may have another email address for you after the break to share with you that you can still get a hold of me with. A small confession is that my btanner11 at cox.net address has become full of emails from the class yesterday of World War II in Kansas of people sharing. And so I just want you to know, I will be cleaning the emails regularly, but if you have trouble, we'll try and have another email address for you to use. Um, so I just, I wanted to be forthright on that and kind of let you know what the status was on that. So, What's the address, the email address? btanner11 at cox.net. Do you see how I, I did that quick pop quiz there? Oh. It may be full, but keep trying, okay? All right. I love some of the stories that you come across in Kansas history. And I love this quote from Ann Bingham. And it is, we had the milk of from four to eight cows every year. There was anything but romance in skimming 20 pans of milk and churning every other day. The butter had its first working with salt on the next morning. It had to be finished for packing or made into rolls. There were all the pans the milk pails again at night, and perhaps milk to skim for weaning calves. Romance indeed. The heat and perspiration make large washings. I have rubbed the skin off my hands in places many a times. The Kansas mud was like paste to remove, and the dust storms would undo the work of a day in five minutes. I did all the sewing for the family besides knitting socks and stockings. Work was no mere pastime in our lives. She wrote that 16 years and a Kansas farm, 1870 to 1886. Now I'm gonna ask how many of you grew up on farms? A lot of you did. How would you describe that work? or that lifestyle. Did you have to do anything? What was your life like on the farm? Did, did you have to do anything? What did you do? Nothing? You fed the chickens? Milk the cows? Worked in the garden? What else? Drive trucks, any of you drive tractors? Okay. What was women's work? The farm wife did everything, and I'm guessing the daughters did too. I grew up on a farm, and I started driving at age five, and by seven I was plowing in the fields. Is that pretty typical for what you guys did? Yes. And again, I wanna say, since 2010, the majority of Kansans now live in what are considered urban areas. Kansas is no longer considered a rural state. How about that? And so your stories reflect um, stories that may be harder to come by. And are they worth preserving? My hunch is they are. So I just kind of want to talk about that a little bit. This next slide, if we can get there, there we go. This is a, a inventor from Iola, and she invented the lip shaper, and this would have been in the 1920s. Now, I'm guessing a few of you have maybe heard of her. Her name was Hazel Mann. Montalegra, I'm going to say that. Anyway, 
she promised that her handheld device, it looks a little like the eyelash curling things, I think, I mean, only a little different. But anyway, this handheld device, if used on the lips, would deliver perfect shaped Cupid bows. Now, how many of you have used one of those? I haven't. <laughs> But she was considered one of the early women inventors here in Kansas. Okay. Um, anyway, um, one of the things that um, I want to talk about just briefly is in for much of Kansas's history, it's always been about hope. When abolitionists first came to Kansas, it was out of hope, hope that they could change things, make order out of chaos, create a new land and a place where the residents could live freely. Decades later, when prohibitionists spoke up, it was again about hope. Staunch defenders of prohibition, the likes of Carrier Nation, who fought fiercely for God, family, and home, had experienced the pain and ill effects of an alcoholic marriage. Their hope was to build stronger families and communities. And as grassroots of populism sprouted and grew across Kansas, it was hope for a better future that fanned its popularity. In each of these movements, Kansas women were leaders and championed the efforts long before they had their own right to vote. Nationally, it wouldn't happen until 1920. It's been 100 years now. But long before then, Kansas would be a stronghold for hope. Kansas women earned the right to vote in local elections by 1887. And in 1912, Kansas voters, men, approved the Equal Suffrage Amendment, becoming only the fourth state to do so. Why Kansas? Kansas was founded with a can-do spirit where everybody had to pitch in. Everybody. And it all began with abolition. One of the things that also inspired me to do this class was the book Pioneer Women by Joanna Stratton. In the 1920s, there was a Kansas woman, Lila Day Monroe, who asked Kansas women. She felt that Kansas was at a point at that point in the 1920s where much of the women who came here as homesteaders, things had changed. Kansas was a little more civilized by their definition than it was when they came in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. And so she asked them to share, these homesteader women, to share their stories. She collected more than 800 but it wouldn't be until a half century later, after her death, that many of the stories became well known. In 1981, Monroe, Monroe's great-granddaughter, Joanna Stratton, completed and published Monroe's projects as pioneer women. The letters were then donated to the Kansas Historical Society. And Stratton writes in the book, that in the 19th century, men and women worked together to create homes, not only for themselves, but their children. And as a result, women found themselves on far more equal footing with their spouses. They plowed, they planted and harvested together. Some yearned for human contact outside their own family, overcoming loneliness and isolation. They endured floods, droughts, hail, fires, chinch bugs, and, and grasshoppers. That loneliness, usually born with dignity and silence, could at times express itself 
in unexpected ways, Stratton wrote. Mary Ferguson Dara recalled a time when Mr. Hilton, a pioneer, told his wife that he was going to Little River for wood, and she asked to go with him. She hadn't seen a tree for two years and hugged it until she was hysterical. Think of that. And it was a woman such as Nancy Ann Rogers who did what they had to do with the only means they had. In 1870, Rogers came to Wichita. And some of you who are uh, familiar with Wichita's history may know, already know this story. But she came to Wichita where she started working as a nurse for the W.C. Woodman family. A few years after she arrived in town, then a single working mother, she noticed a pain in her left breast. She went to one of the town doctors who diagnosed her as having cancer. He uh, told her it, he would charge her $25 to cut it out. It was money she didn't have. So later, Ray Woodman, who was part of the Woodman family, um, she was a noted historian and journalist for the Wichita Eagle, later wrote about Rogers. The nurse went home. She cooked enough food for two boys, William and Samuel, to last a week or more. Then checked herself into a local boarding house, arranged the furniture to meet her needs, partially undressed and proceeded to cut her own breast off with a sharp knife. Rogers would survive her own care and determination. She did that by herself. Stories of grit, strength, courage, and determination, like Rogers, fill Kansas history. But it would take more, much more, to finally bring women's rights into the voting booth. Take a look at some of these photos. What do they tell you about the people that are in these photos? I'm thinking the ones of this, I'm guessing the whole family had fabric that may have looked the exact same way. What do you think? We did that in our family. And the upper right-hand photo, who is that? That should be one of the most, uh, you should already know that woman. Who is it? Carrie Nation. Carrie Nation, you're absolutely right. We'll get into her a little later. And I love this holiday photo with the tree. It's unusual to get these photos um, from different perspectives, in large part because Cameras were not a, I mean, from this turn, it looks like a turn of the century, maybe late 19th century photo. Think about how unusual that was, but how reflective it was of daily life. So I love some of these photos that um, show women in their dresses uh, branding cattle. Um, there's the bottom one that shows um, women in Victoria out by Hayes. Um, and I think the upper one is of um, Linsborg. And then the lower one is of families going through in their wagons. We've all heard those stories. One of the, the, the stories that's most often told is of Martin and Osa Johnson. And I'm hoping many of you have heard their stories. Have you? Do you are you familiar with what they... Excellent. They... Uh, 
were from Chanute. Um, Martin was a photographer that, uh, a local photographer that um, uh, became quite smitten by Osa and he married her and in the late 1920s and 30s, their names um, were synonymous with African safaris or adventures into um, places like the South Seas. And, and um, they offered for many people in the nation a chance to see Africa for the first time through their motion pictures. And Osa was um, most famous for um, writing after Martin's death, the book, I Married Adventure. And it talked about their lives together. They uh, had planes that uh, were painted like, uh, I think a giraffe and a zebra. They are extremely well known and were um, an influence for so many Kansans during the first half of the 20th century. And of course, we've all heard of Amelia Earhart and all the things that she did. She was, of course, born um, in a house that was her grandfather's, grandparents' house. Her grandfather was a judge in Atchison, Judge Alfred Otis. And although she, um, her parents lived in Kansas City, she and her sister Muriel spent much of their childhood in the house in Atchison that overlooks the Missouri River. And of course, it's well known that she slid down banisters and learned to read. She played with imaginary friends and sledded on the bluffs overlooking the Missouri River. Um, of course, um, she made headlines when she became the first woman to cross the Atlantic as a passenger and then to fly solo across the Atlantic, um, to fly nonstop across the United States. And um, then on June 1st, 1937, she left on a 29,000 mile journey, hoping to become the first pilot to fly around the world at the equator. We all know what happened to her. What happened to her? She disappeared. Uh, yes, that's true. Um, and was never heard from again. However, in recent years, there's more um, evidence kind of showing that maybe um, her they may have come across um, some evidence that where she may have uh, uh, landed on an island and that's where she and her navigator, Fred Noonan, uh, may have perished. Um, but um, there's some evidence that she may have lived sometime after the, that uh, plane crash. Now, one of the things that we often talk about, too, is um, of the women who made headlines in the day. Susanna Medora Salter from Argonia became famous for what? She was the first woman elected mayor of a town in the United States. Um, she, uh, it was after Kansas had gained the right to vote in municipal elections um, that she was elected the mayor. And she was nominated on the Prohibition Party and on a ticket by several Argonia men as a joke. And she surprised the group when she actually received two-thirds of the vote. And she was elected on April 4th, 1887. Um, she took people by surprise. You know why? She was good at what she did. And, but that was the only 
positions she ever held. She did not go on to any, any higher office than mayor of Argonia. Um, she died in 1961. Um, but, um, she will forever be part of Kansas history, um, for that election. Hattie McDaniel, of course we know about Hattie. She was born here in Wichita and, um, she, uh, received, um, the, um, best, uh, supporting actress role, um, Academy Award, um, for, um, her uh, role as Mammy in Gone with the Wind. And, uh, and in more recent years, one of the women that has begun to be part more known about her in uh, Kansas history, and that is Lucy Taya Eads. And Pauline Sharp, how many of you know her? Excellent. She is part of, um, I think she's also part of the Kansas Humanities, the Humanities Kansas featured speakers, um, but she portrays her grandmother, Chief Lucy Taya Eads. Um, chief Lucy was the first woman chief of the Kanza, Kanza uh, tribe, nation, um, and it is an amazing story, and it's one that we don't hear very often, and that is of, in terms of diversity of what Native American women um, have done and how they um, persevered. Um, Chief Lucy um, was, was um, she was adopted by Chief Washunga. She, she uh, her parents died when she was very young, and uh, leaving her brother uh, and herself as the only surviving members of her family. Chief Washunga um, adopted her, and he died in 1908. And um, so she went to Haskell University and studied to become a nurse. And she ended up going to New York City and um, living there for a while. Um, her, she married a um, man who was kind of on the um, vaudeville circuit at the time. And it was an unsuccessful marriage in the sense that they were divorced. And then she married her husband, John Eads, around 1913. She was elected uh, chief of the CAW in 1922. And she has just, Pauline Sharp does this justice. But I love what um, she told reporters at the time she was elected. I cannot tell you just yet how I feel about being chosen chief of the cause, for the honor is too new. That's what she told the Tulsa World on November 2nd, 1922. I fully realize the responsibilities which I have assumed, but I appreciate the opportunity I have to help my people. Her story, if you ever get a chance to learn more about it, is well worth um, looking into. Um, I would also encourage you, if ever Pauline Sharp is giving a talk or a presentation, go and seek her out. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you asked. Go hear Pauline Sharp. <laughs> um, so, Let's go back to the title of this class. She weren't no fainting lily nor battle axe. What does that mean to you? And I'm going to encourage you to come up here and, and if you have comments, to say them. Um, anybody at this point? No one. No one. Ferris Bueller. Um, yes? Think about what that means to you and what are some of the things that have been qualities of women that 
um, maybe have held that? Battle axe to me would mean carry nation. And um, so any woman that was like that was a battle axe, right? Oh, we will so get into that later on. I promise you, that's an excellent point. Anyone else? Okay. You speak now or forever hold your peace. I just got to say, I've never been called a battle axe or a feigning lily, but I have been called formidable. <laughs> I love that. Connie, did you have a comment? Get up here. I love the participation and I want to encourage you guys. Fainting Lily, I think, reminds me of Archie Bunker's wife. Closer to the microphone. Fainting Lily, to me, brings to mind Archie Bunker's wife. Edith, yes. Any other comments or thoughts? Oh, good. We have one more comment. Well, if we're talking fainting Lily, which is like a, a woman who would faint at the drop of a blood versus Carrie Nation, the battle axe, then somewhere in between is probably a hardy, sturdy woman. I agree with you on that. I think you're absolutely right. Um, although I will say, and I'm, I'm hoping you might agree with me, I have met fainting Lilies in my lifetime. Have you guys? We know them, yes. Um, but I, one of the things that also inspired me about doing this class is this photo. I have no idea who this woman is. This is a photo that a friend of mine purchased in an antique store near Hayes probably about 25 years ago. So if any of you know who this woman is, please let me know. But look at the face of this woman. She scares me. How about you? I mean, she looks strong, doesn't she? I bet she has a heart of gold. I'm just looking at her face here. But... She looks like she could accomplish just about anything that life threw at her, don't you think? So that's kind of what I'm, I'm, I know this may sound a little odd, but I really do want you to look into the faces of, of the old photos of women. And tell me what you see. They did not have as many dentists. That's a good point. I want to show you pictures of my own family. Do these people look like people you could have a pizza and beer with? No, they do not. They were very much into prohibition. My great-grandmother up there, she scares me too. <laughs> but... Do you see what I'm saying? These people were tough. Um, so look at those kind of things and those qualities. I mean, certainly some of the people we, we often highlight when we talk about Kansas women, of course, are Gwendolyn Brooks, who uh, was born on her grandmother's table, kitchen table, um, when she... Um, and um, her writing is always so fascinating to me. Here's a snippet. Say to them, say to the downkeepers, the sun slappers, the self-soilers, the harmony hushers, even if you are not ready for day, it cannot always be night. You will be right, for that is the hard home run. Live not the battles won. Live not for the end of the song. Live in the along. And that was from her book, Selected Poems. Um, she often wrote about war and racism. 
drug use and love, anything was worthy of one of her subjects. Um, and she went on to, oh my heavens, she won the um, President Kennedy in 1962 invited her to read at the Library of Con uh, Congress Poetry Festival. In the 1980s, she was the first African-American woman to become a poetry consultant for the Library of Congress. Um, these people, these women, um, they do, they speak their truth. Um, certainly one of the most famous, Erin Brockovich, um, she uh, was born Lawrence. Um, she also, I think, has connections with Wichita. Um, she went to K-State and, and um, then went on to Dallas and uh, then other places um, before, of course, the movie was made about her and, and she still is speaking her truth. Carrie A. Nation, we get to her. There are so many things we can talk about with Carrie Nation. Um, her name was originally Carrie, C-A-R-R-I-E, Amelia Moore, was actually put as Carrie, C-A-R-R-Y, in the family Bible by her father. Later on, as she grew up, um, she changed the name to the common spelling, but then she became uh, more involved in the prohibition movement. She um, changed her name to Carrie back to the original spelling, C-A-R-R-Y, so she could sign her newsletters, Carrie A Nation, um, and um, her, she, her followers were called the Home Defenders. And as many of you know, she believed it was important to um, raid saloons. And one of the things she did, um, Wichita changed her. Before, she would raid saloons um, with like bats and bricks and that kind of thing. Um, after she raided the saloon, um, the Eaton Saloon or in Old Town, um, it was a Wichita Eagle uh, reporter who suggested to her that she might be more effective if she carried an ax. And so she began doing that and they were called hatchets. Um, and when she performed a, a destruction of a saloon, it was called hatchetations. Um, she uh, is very colorful in, in Kansas history, made international news at the time she was doing much of her hatchetations. Um, she um, pled with the governor back then, William Stanley, to um, just enforce the state's laws on prohibition. As many of you know, Kansas was the first nation, um, our first state in the nation to have, uh, to change its constitution regarding uh, prohibition. And they did that in 1881. She did not get going until um, really turn of the 20th century. And she pleaded with Governor Stanley, who was from Wichita, she pleaded with him to enforce the laws. Um, he did not give her any assurances that he would do that. And she pointed to a black eye she had received at Enterprise when she um, had a uh, hatchetation and that she had gotten a black eye. And she said, Governor, you gave me that black eye. And um, the rattled governor said, you are a woman, but a woman must know a woman's place. They can't come in here and raise this kind of disturbance. 
So imagine that. I think we ought to take a small break, and when we come back, let's talk a little more about these women, okay?
let's come back together. I want to first give you, um, it's a little bit of a convoluted email, um, but it will also work in case you're having trouble with the btanner11 at cox.net. And it is a misspelling of my name. I'll be honest with you, but it is Rebecca Jane Tanner, all one word, and the Tanner is spelled this time T-A-N-N-E-E-R at gmail.com. It was accepted. I'm going to go with it. Rebecca Jane Tanner, T-A-N-N-E-E-R at gmail.com. It has plenty of space. Yes. Rebecca is R-E-B-E-C-C-A, Jane, J-A-N-E-T-A-N-N-E-E-R at gmail.com, all lowercase, all one space, all scrunched together. Okay? It's at gmail.com. So if you have any trouble with the btanner11 at cox.net, use this alternative email, and that should get you where you need to go. You can use it for both, anytime, any way. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it will work. <laughs> um, you know, one thing I want to just give a shout out is that, you know, we're focusing a lot on the Kansas women and some of their stories. But I also want to give, out, uh, give a shout out to men who have also made it possible for women to go ahead and do the things that they want to do and that are supportive. And so I just want to say that and to show appreciation, that kind of thing. Folks, though, like Carrie Nation, didn't always have that opportunity. And, you know, they, she, they would get many things said about them. Um, there was a reporter from upstate New York who called Carrie Nation short and dumpy a figure rather than tall and commandy, n commanding, nervous and flighty, of manner rather than calm and impressing. And Emporia's William Allen White had similar negative comments about her. Um, she ended up in jail more than 30 different times. And her husband, David Nation, filed for divorce on the grounds of desertion because she was always traveling. Um, a year before Kansas women received the right to vote, Carrie Nation died on June 9, 1911, in Leavenworth, Kansas. Um, her epitaph, which she chose, reads, She hath done what she could. <laughs> I love that. I think, you know, one of the things about her, I do think, is that she was misunderstood. I think that um, a lot of information was often said about her that, um, particularly by reporters of the day, um, who, did not, who did not look at her favorably. Um, I know that Marsh Murdoch of the Wichita Eagle did not look at her favorably. Um, I love what Blair Tarr, he's at the Kansas State Historical Society, and he's um, in charge of collections, uh, the artifacts at, at this Kansas State Topeka, um, the Kansas State um, Museum and in Topeka. And he says, she may have had extreme methods. I'm not going to argue that point, but she did believe in things. And if she was interested in something, you could count on her support. Um, I think that's pretty telling about her. Um, Kansas was a keystone state um, for human rights when abolitionists 
and slavery proponents wrestled over how Kansas would enter the Union. In the territorial years of Kansas from 1854 to 1861, there are many heroes. But when it comes to women's rights, let's look at um, people like Clarina Nichols, um, who made a few suggestions to the Kansas Constitution. Nichols was an associate editor of the Quindara China Dowan, uh, I, Dowan, I believe is how it's pronounced, in eastern Kansas, and she was an abolitionist and a suffragette. In 1859, she was the only woman invited to a white males only convention. Despite the invite, she was not allowed to talk while the convention was in session. This was the convention that ended up determining Kansas going into the nation. Um, and it was the convention that determined the Kansas Constitution. So, Clarina Nichols would sit while this males only convention, while the men debated what would go into the Constitution. She sat and she knitted and listened. Then she would lobby for women's rights when the men took breaks. Because of her, Kansas had the first state-run university that allowed women to attend classes alongside men. Kansas women had their rights protected in court long before other states saw the need. And for example, that meant Kansas women could buy and sell their own property and retain custody of their own children in cases of divorce. And because of Nichols advocating, Kansas women were allowed to vote in school district elections more than three decades before the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was passed. She would say, I have a great respect for manhood, Nichols said in 1851. The responsibilities of women, at, and she spoke this at the Second National Women's Rights Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts. When I listen to Fourth of July orations, and the loud cannon and reflect that these are tributes of admiration paid to our fathers because they compelled freedom for themselves and sons for the hands of oppression and power, I labor in hope, for I have faith that when men come to value their own rights, they will feel themselves more honored in releasing the inalienable rights of women. Um, and it was... You know, in 1863, August 21st, 1863, when William Quantrell raided Lawrence, and it was largely the mothers, the wives, the sisters, and the daughters who picked up the pieces after the raids because their men had been killed. They were the ones that were left with burying family members, rebuilding and reshaping a community that would rise from its ashes. And often these women were of average background and means. I love the story of Agnes Osman. On January 1st, 1901, she asked her minister in Topeka, Kansas, Charles Parham to lay hands on her as she prayed. He did, and she began speaking in tongues in reference to the Bible, Acts 2, 38. It was the birth of the Pentecostal movement. In Kansas? <laughs> One of my favorite stories is about Mother Mary Bickerdyke. Um, she was a Civil War nurse, and she volunteered um, to go to the various battlegrounds um, to help the hundreds of men who were dying. Some, not from the battles themselves, but from typhoid, dysentery, and other diseases. Um, she traveled with the Army of Tennessee and was present at at least 19 battles including Shiloh and Sherman's March to the Sea. 
Um, by the end of the war, she had helped to provide 300 hospitals for the wounded and the sick. And um, she was admired by General William Sherman, who asked her to ride beside him as soldiers marched through Washington at the, after the war had ended. Um, for many years, she continued um, to do many things, um, benevolent acts. Uh, she was always known as mother, and uh, she helped Kansas. Um, she came here after the war, and she encouraged veterans to come to Kansas to start their lives over. And uh, she helped victims after Indian raids, farmers after grasshopper invasions, and many other things. Um, she settled uh, first around Salina, and then around Ellsworth and Bunker Hill. Um, but I think she has an incredible story. One surgeon during the Civil War was so upset with her fussy ways um, that he asked uh, General Sherman um, to please do something about her. And of course, the comment was, Sherman said, I can't, she outranks me. <laughs> How many of you know about the Women's Christian Temperance Union? Oh, I'm hoping all of you do. Um, certainly my grandmother was a member. How many of you had grandmothers? Are any of you members still? See, I'm not either. Which is why my ancestors, my great-grandmother, probably would not sit down for a pizza and beer with me. Um, that was a joke, and I'm sorry for making that very bad joke. Um, but the Women's Christian Temperance Union, in fact, it's still, although it won't be this year, um, they always have a booth at the Kansas State Fair um, where you can get water, you know, underneath the grandstand. Do any of you ever stop there? Well, it's there. I think it's kind of a cool thing. Um for many of the members, um, I know my grandmother, my mother signed vows that they would not drink. Um, they would not let liquor pass their lips. Is that familiar to you guys? Isn't that amazing? Um, I, I find that interesting. Um, but um, they were organized as a um, camp meeting in Nor Lawrence in 1878. And um, the Kansas chapter was, and they adopted the badge, the white ribbon, symbolic not only of purity and peace, but includes all cor correlated reforms that center in the protection of the home. And um, they were very much concerned. One of my favorite Kansas characters, you'll see that all of these people are some of my favorite Kansas characters. Um, but Mary Elizabeth Lease, she was one of the leaders um, in the populist movement, lived here in Wichita and was famous for the quote, Wall Street owns the country. It is no longer a government of the people for the people and by the people, but a government for Wall Street, by Wall Street and for Wall Street. The great common people of the country are slaves, and monopoly is the master. Let the bloodhounds of money who have dogged us thus far beware. Don't you love that? Um, the rise of the populist movement began in the 1890s. Um, there had been a severe drought, and many of the farmers were upset because the railroads were were um, charging exorbitant rates for them to ship their crops, all of those things. So farmers in Kansas, in places like Medicine Lodge and Stafford County and, and um, Wichita at McPherson, they organized. It was a grassroots movement. And um, it began with families, with men, women, children becoming a part of this. I know my grandfather was named James Weaver Tanner. James Weaver was the presidential candidate for the Populist Party. I'm thinking they kind of got wrapped up into the movement. What do you think? 
But it's, um, it's fascinating. And Mary Elizabeth Lee, my heavens, the things she did. And, you know, places like, oh, gosh, the Ark City uh, Traveler um, called her foul of mouth and, you know, all of those things and ugly. And imagine that, um, you know, as you go to different communities and you speak out for the rights of farm families, um, getting that kind of treatment. Louise Caldwell Murdoch. Yes. Come, come talk. Come talk, please. It's just, it makes it so much easier for people online to hear what you're saying. That's all. And you're right. This is a good comment. She's also, she's also known for saying, raise more hell, less corn. And that is true, although she later said she had been misquoted, but went with it. That's what I love about her. <laughs> um, but it is a great quote. Um, and she remains one of my favorites in terms because she ran for president and was upset that the populist party did not back her because she was a woman. Um, I think that's interesting to note as well. I know Marsh Murdoch did not care much for her. Uh, he did not approve that she would ride a bicycle with uh, just pantaloons on. Um, she, um, she did many things here in Wichita um, and is well worth our study. Um, Louise Caldwell Murdoch, I think, is another woman um, that was an advocate of the suffrage movement, um, but she also was very much part of um, establishing the art scene here in Wichita. She uh, was a designer. Um, she helped found the 20th Century Club here in Wichita and uh, she served as its president and then would study interior design in New York City. And when she returned to, Kent, to Wichita, she designed the Caldwell Murdoch Building on East Douglas um, and also helped design the old um, Wichita Library, the Carnegie Library. Um, now, um, she's, she established the funds, the money, uh, for the Wichita Art Museum. Um, you had a comment? Come up here if you can. Was the 20th Century Club uh, a statewide or was it just Wichita? It was Wichita, I believe, oh. just Wichita. Um, so, and that's a good question. That's an excellent point. Georgia niece Clark Gray had one of the best autograph, known autographs for a long, long time. She was the first woman treasurer. In fact, I have a photo up here. Here, she uh, was the first woman treasurer for the U.S. Um, she was a banker, also an actress. Um, she was born in 1898, and um, she uh, in Richland, Kansas. And uh, she went on. She was an early supporter of Harry Truman, and it was this support that brought her the nomination as the first woman to be treasurer of the United States. Uh, she served in that office from 1949 to 1953. Um, and her name was known to millions because of her signature on all U.S. currency. Um, the disadvantages of the job, she said, was low pay. And asked if she could afford to take the job, she said, can I afford not to? Um, which I kind of like that about her. Minnie Grinstead. 
she's, how many of you have heard of her? See, I think she's kind of been lost uh, to Kansas history. Um, she was the first woman Kansas state legislator, legislator. She was a temperance lecturer and organizer. Um, she was uh, from liberal. Uh, she served Seward County voters. Um, she was, again, the state's first um, state legislator. Um, she served in 1918 and at first, the men of the House were skeptical. They believed, reported the Kansas City Star, that Mrs. Grinstead would be a fussy member and that she would scold and find fault and nag them for smoking cigars. They had visions of having to speak in whispers when they wished to express their thoughts in the plain Kansas language. Oh, my. Elizabeth Hoisington, um, she uh, came from a family with a long history of military backgrounds. Um, her dad, Perry Hoisington, helped found the Kansas National Guard. And um, she attended the um, Women's Auxiliary, Army Auxiliary Corps which was changed to the Women's Army Corps in 1943. She was, in 1966, named the director of the uh, Women's Army Corps, and her, in her five years of directing, raised the enlistment of women from fewer to 10,000 to 13,000, and expanded their roles in the Army. Um, she was the first woman to be named Brigadier General, um, and... Uh, she uh, was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star Medal. And of course, one of my favorites is Ada McCall. I have written about her many, many times. Um, she was always known as the cow chip lady until about the 1980s. Uh, and her photo has been published in hundreds of of Western magazines and books and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't until the 1980s that her granddaughter looked at, um, I think there had been a magazine with the Kansas State Historical Society come out with her photo, and a granddaughter recognized her grandmother and uh, pointed it out to the Kansas State Historical Society. And so we are, you know, that was how we got to know Ada McCall. Um, so, I mean, her story is also interesting in that, you know, back in the 1880s, 90s, um, not many people had cameras. She had one, and she would take photos and that kind of thing. And in fact, that photo shows her um, telling her mother how to take the photo and she has her mouth open as she was giving instructions on take the picture. Um, I just think that's funny. Um, other women, we can go back to Ada, I think. Um, other women that are worthy of note, Elizabeth Wooster. Um, she was um, the first woman elected to the statewide um, public office, education office. Um, her name was Lorraine Elizabeth Wooster. She was known as a battle axe. She could be quite formidable. Uh, when the railroad, um, she had her own line of books that were sent out to school teachers all across Kansas. She wrote them. And she sent these out to, um, to the schools and the railroad wanted to charge her a, uh, like a dollar for every hundred books. And uh, Lizzie would say that they needed to charge maybe 50 cents, and she got them to come down. Um, so, I mean, she was um, able to negotiate. Um, she uh, served as superintendent of public instruction, um, and um, she... I mean, when you're thinking about the turn of the 20th century, imagine how hard that had to have been. Um, 
to just be able to to make some of those those changes in the way things are done. Kate Richards O'Hare is another person. She was known as Red Kate. She was a member of the Socialist Party, and um, she uh, was um, known for being a, a speaker uh, that traveled the circuit. Kansas, um, as many of you I, I'm sure know, was a hotbed for the socialist movement, particularly in southeast Kansas. And um, she was one of the, the leading people. Jane Grant, um, she was born in Girard, Kansas, socialist hotbed. <laughs> and uh, she went to New York, and um, she uh, was soon part of uh, the Algonquin Club and the Lucy Stone League. And um, she uh, became part of the New York Times and later helped start the New Yorker. Um, she is an interesting, interesting character. And one of my favorites is Emily Morgan. Do any, does that name ring a bell with any of you? She was known as the angel of the Yukon. She is um, one of the reasons that the Iditarod race is run each year. Uh, she was the nurse who identified the diphtheria epidemic that was going on in Alaska, in Nome, Alaska, and um, that they did not have enough of the vaccine to, um, to save the community. And so that was how um, the Iditarod race began. Um, but um, she is quite a character. Um, so anyway, those are some of the things for, that we have to, to think about for next week. Um, I'm hoping you remember what your assignment is. What is it? Do this. Read, read that, but also do your homework. And one of the things is write about the women who've influenced you. You know, what do they have uh, that most influenced you? And, you know, you can even throw in the men who also influenced you and what they did as well and how they contributed um, to you and maybe to your daughters or grandchildren, any of those. Send photos. Use whatever email works. Any questions, comments? Yes. Try and have them to me by next Tuesday. You can do whatever you want. It's America. I'm going to say that in the sense of whoever story most influenced you, please use that. My hunch is it'll probably be family members or maybe neighbors or, or someone that maybe was a teacher. I don't know. Even if we're here in person, we still send it to, the, to you no, by email. No, if you're going to be here in person... I would like for you to just present it next week, if you could. Okay, would that be okay? You. Thank you. Yes. All right. I, I can't hear. Anything else? Well, you guys, I sure have enjoyed having you today. Um, those online, thank you for, for watching. And uh, feel free to send me your stories and photos. Look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.